Love Lifted Me. Let's sing the first and the last. Aren't you glad for that love? Man, the unconditional uh, love of God is awesome. That's why we're here today, right? Um, I'm excited about revival coming up by the end of the end of this month. Um, we're going to do revival the way we hadn't done it in a while. Um, we're going to have revival over the weekend. Uh, we're going to have a Friday night service. We're going to have a Saturday morning service. We're going to have a Saturday night service. Then we'll have a Sunday morning service. And then on Sunday night, uh, we're going to have a uh, praise service and a testimony service. And so I'd like for you to be praying um, <clears throat> about God speaking to you, uh, about maybe sharing a testimony during that time of what God's done uh, in your life. Uh, Denise just shared a, a small testimony with us here just a minute ago. Uh, God's working in their life uh, this, this past summer. And, um, and so uh, don't, um, let's see, how, how can I put this? Uh, don't wait for me to ask you, I guess you'd say. Let, take this as I am asking you now, okay? So, uh, so if God's speaking to your heart, um, please let me know, and, um, and, and I'm going to be praying about, uh, about that too, but a wonderful service. I tell you, something special happens in a service, and we've had some of these services. Something special happens in the service when God is worshiped in song and when the people of God step up and share what God's doing in their lives. Something special happens. And uh, it's my prayer. Uh, Brother Gene Douglas is going to be with us to preach all weekend. And, um, and as you know, he's been with us before. And he, he's a, he can really bring the Word of God in, in a very uh, powerful way. Uh, so we're looking forward to that. Uh, Mike Britt and Angela are going to be with us uh, Friday and Saturday. And uh, so they do a wonderful job in leading in worship. And, um, and so I know God's got some wonderful things in store for us for the whole weekend. And, uh, and so we're just looking forward to, uh, to um, letting God work in our hearts and our lives and, and in our church. So, uh, so circle that weekend. Uh, make a point to, uh, to be here that weekend. And, um, and, and we look forward to seeing what God's going to do. Uh, in <clears throat> Isaiah chapter 49... Isaiah chapter 49, uh, Isaiah is one of those Old Testament prophets that <clears throat> who points to the person of Jesus Christ as the promised Messiah, the fulfillment of God's new covenant uh, with, uh, with his people and the way that God's going to reach the world. And in Isaiah 49, it speaks to the person of Jesus. So I want you to think think as we read this passage in terms of Jesus fulfilling this prophecy and then how that has affected us in who we are today. It says in verse 5, 
And now says the Lord, who formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him, so that Israel might be gathered to him. For I am honored in the sight of the Lord, and my God is my strength. He says, it is not enough for you to be my servant, raising up the tribes of Jacob and restoring the protected ones of Israel. I will also make you a light for the nations to be my salvation to the ends of the earth. We're here today because of who Jesus is. Lord, thank you so much for the love that you have demonstrated to us in the fact that Jesus, the promised one, Jesus, the Son of God, the Savior of the world, would leave the glories of heaven, the perfect fellowship with the Father, and come into this sin-sick world to bear our sin. And as the Bible says, that God has demonstrated His love for us in this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And as God's people, we say amen. And we say thank you, God, for loving us that way. Thank you for loving us unconditionally and thank you for your grace that transforms us. And Lord, I pray as as we've read your word, Lord, that the gospel is the light to the nations. Lord, it not only is redeeming Israel, but Lord, it is the light to all nations. And Lord, we exist today. We are the church. We are the body of Christ because of your love and because of your grace and because of your calling in our lives and because of your great salvation. Lord, I pray that we would worship you today in spirit and in truth. And and Lord, I pray that today that as you meet us in this place, Lord, with your spirit, Lord, that you would set our hearts, Lord, on a path uh, toward revival. Lord, we need revival in, in not only in our country and in our community, but Lord, we need revival, Lord, in our church and in our homes and our personal lives. Lord, we need that reconnection with you in, in, a, in a genuine and real and dynamic way. And Lord, I pray that you would set our hearts right today, Lord, that you would set us on that path, God, where we will hear from you, that we will connect with you, and that your life and your spirit, God, would, would bear fruit in our lives that we might be the light that you call us to be, that we might live by the love in which you've given us, that we might share your truth, Lord, Uh, through our lives to others. So thank you, Lord, for this day. May your will be done. May you be glorified in our lives. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now if you'll join me and turn into 564, just a closer walk with thee. We'll sing the first and the last. Now for our offertory hymn, you'll turn to 410, Standing on the Promises. We'll sing the first and the last. 
Let us pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this opportunity you've given us to come out, bow before your throne and worship you. We pray that you would be with Brother Chad and Denise as they lead us in word and song. Father, I pray that you would use your spirit to pour out upon us, Father, and I pray that we'd be open and willing to receive it, Father. I do thank you for this time and the service where you've given us the opportunity to show our faith in you by giving back. And I pray that we would give in accordance to your will and your word. In Christ our Savior's name we pray. Amen.
amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Twas grace that taught my heart to be, and grace my fears relieved. How precious, dear, that grace above the hour I first believed. My chains are gone, I've been set free. My God, my Savior, has ransomed me. Has promised good to me. His word, my hope, secures. He will my shield and portion be as long as life endures. My chains are gone. My God, my Savior has ransomed me, and like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace. My chains are gone, I've been saved. My God, my Savior has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace. The earth shall soon dissolve like snow the sun forbear to shine but god who called me here below will be forever mine will be Amen. Thank you, Denise. Because of God's amazing grace, no matter how hopeless your situation seems, that hopeless situation can be transformed because of God's amazing grace. Ezekiel, Ezekiel, let's go to the Old Testament, the book of Ezekiel this morning, and uh, chapter 37, chapter 37, the book of Ezekiel. Maybe you've had a, a similar experience uh, to me in this. Um, here a while back, I came walking out of the house. Uh, Christy, Christy was gone to work. She took one of our vehicles and, and had gone to work. And uh, so I get the keys. I come walking out of, of my house to get in the other vehicle. 
turn it over and nothing. It's dead. It's dead. And maybe you've had that experience, that you come out, that car battery's dead, it's not cranking, you're not going anywhere. And I thought, okay, well, this is what I need, right? Need some of these uh, little fellas. Jumper cables, right? So the only problem that particular day is uh, I have, as you know, I have some other vehicles sitting around my house. But they're all old. And uh, some of them have been sitting up for a pretty good while. And so they were all dead too. And even though I had jumper cables, I had nothing to connect it to. Because you see, for that battery to fire, it has to be connected. There has to be a transference of power. There has to be a transference of life from a source that has the power and that has the life into the dead battery, right? Otherwise, you're not going anywhere. You're in a hopeless situation. Today, as we look at Ezekiel, we're going to look at a hopeless situation in the history of Israel. Now, if you turn to Ezekiel... If you want to know where Ezekiel is, if you find Proverbs and Psalms there in your Bible about midway through, and you hang a right, you're going to cruise on past uh, Jeremiah, you're going to pass uh, Lamentations, and then you want to stop right there before you get to Daniel, and you'll find Ezekiel. Ezekiel. Now let's give a little background to this hopeless situation in the history of God's people. At this point in the nation's history, um, Israel had then gone through a civil war. They were a divided nation. And after that civil war, Israel was divided into two kingdoms. Basically, the northern kingdom, which consisted of ten tribes, and it was called Israel, and the southern kingdom of Judah, which consisted of two tribes. Now, the northern kingdom of Israel had departed from God and gone into idolatry, and God judged them. God allowed them to be captured. God allowed them to be destroyed about a century before the southern kingdom of Judah. Now, that partic these particular people of the northern kingdom, they had been conquered. They had lost all of their national identity. They had been carried into exile by the Assyrian, uh, by the Assyrian kingdom or empire at that time. And losing all their national identity, they would become known in history as the lost tribes of Israel. And when you come to the southern kingdom of Judah, over a century later, because of their idolatry as well, God judges them. And the southern kingdom of Judah is taken into exile by the Babylonians under King Nebuchadnezzar around 597 B.C. At that particular time, 10,000 citizens of Judah were carried off into what's known as the Babylonian exile. It is a pivotal moment in the history of God's people, and it is one of the darkest, most hopeless times of the Jewish people, the nation of Israel. In this first group of exiles that were taken from Judah, there was a young man by the name of Ezekiel. Ezekiel. Five years into his Babylonian captivity and exile, God gives him the word. God gives him the visions that are recorded in the book of Ezekiel. And it's interesting because uh, Ezekiel came from a priestly line, therefore he was going to be a priest and at the very time, at the age of 30, at the age of 30, when he would have been a priest and began to serve his appointment as a priest, that's when he receives his visions while he's in exile. Visions of hope, visions of God's message to his people. Now think about this young man here at this time, taken from his homeland in the first wave of captives. These captives forced to their knees under the oppression of the power of the Babylonian Empire. And in that moment, that time, there was no way of escape. 
they lost so many things on so many levels. They lost their homes. They lost their city. For Jerusalem was destroyed in 586 B.C. The temple was destroyed. They lost their identity. They lost their culture. They lost their traditions and their rituals. And many of them, many of them lost their faith. It was this time in Israel's history, one of the darkest and seemingly hopeless times. In the midst of this hopeless moment, God sends a wake-up call to His people. A message of revival through the prophet Ezekiel. And God takes him, of all places, to a valley of dry bones to give him a message of hope. Isn't that something? Takes him to the cemetery. To give him a message of hope. Let's read it together. Chapter 37 of Ezekiel. It says, the prophet writes, The hand of the Lord was on me, and he brought me out by his spirit, and he set me down in the middle of the valley. You know, a valley is the lowest place you can be, right? It's the lowest place you can be. you got to look up to see the bottom when you get to the valley, Right? But even lower than that, look what happens. It was full of bones. He led me around all of them. There was a great many of them on the surface of the valley, and they were very dry. They'd been there a long time. It represented defeat. It represented destruction. It represented shame as well. because It wasn't buried properly. Then he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? I replied, Lord God, sovereign Lord, Lord God, only you know. He said to me, prophesy concerning these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Lord God says to these bones. I will cause breath to enter you. And you will live. I will put tendons on you and make flesh grow on you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you so that you come to life. Then you will know I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I had been commanded. And while I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound. And the bones came together. Boy, wouldn't you like to see that? Bone to bone. And as I looked, tendons appeared on them and flesh grew and skin covered them. And that, but, but there was no breath in them. He said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man. Say to it, this is what the Lord God says. Breath, come from the four winds and breathe into these slain so that they may come alive. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath entered them. And they came to life, and they stood on their feet, a vast army. Wow, isn't that an amazing vision? Verse 11, then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. This is the people of Israel. Look how they say, Our bones are dried up. Our hope has perished. You see, these people in exile said, we're hopeless. We are in a hopeless situation. We are just like those dry bones. And so God takes Ezekiel to the boneyard to give him the vision of hope. Therefore, prophesy and say to them, This is what the Lord God says. I'm going to open your graves. I'm going to bring you up from them, my people. And I'm going to lead you into the land of Israel. The land that you're in exile now, that land represents the graves. I'm bringing you back. I'm bringing you back. There's going to be a revival. It's coming. There's going to be a renewal. It's coming. I'm bringing life back to my people, says God. And look what he says here. You will know when this happens, you will know I am the Lord. My people, when I open your graves and bring you up from them, I will put my spirit in you 
and you will live. And I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know I am the Lord. I have spoken and I will do it. And this is the declaration of the Lord. So understand the context as I've set it up in the background. Ezekiel in captivity, in exile, is speaking a message to the people who are hopeless. You see, those dry bones represent the whole house of Israel, right? They represent their hopeless situation. They're in that valley. They're at the lowest place they can be. They are scattered. They are very dry. They are defeated. They are destroyed. They are all but dead in their exile. And this picture of these dry bones in this valley, it not only captures their national condition, but it captures their spiritual condition. It captures their spiritual condition. And what does Ezekiel ask God? Or what does God ask Ezekiel? Can these bones what? Can these bones live? And what does Ezekiel say? Lord God, only you know. Only you know. That is a statement of, I give up. God, I don't know. God, I don't have the answers. God, I can't fix this mess. God, there's nothing that I can do about this helpless situation. I can't change this hopeless moment. Just like Israel, we have history. You have history. Just like Israel, there are things in our lives, choices that that we've made, things that have happened to us that have taken us into a valley, a valley of dry bones. How often that we come times of our lives, we're at that point. We're dried up. Spiritually, mentally, relationally. We lost our passion. We lost our drive. We lost our purpose in serving the Lord. We're in that valley. Maybe we're struggling personally. Maybe that valley is a dried up marriage. Our dried up family situation. Maybe we have come to that point in our life where we're no longer faithful to the church. We're no longer faithful to worship. Maybe we come to a point in our career where we don't know which way to go anymore. We feel stuck, dried up, dead. We see no life, no way out, no way to fix the mess. We look at our communities and we look at our our culture and we see family after family decimated by drug addiction. We see one situation after another situation of, of violence and wickedness and evil in our own communities and across our country. And we wonder, how do we fix this mess? I don't have an answer. I don't know what to do. We look at our churches and so many churches sit in communities that are dying and, and the church seems to have no influence, no impact, be able to have, has no power to affect change in the lives of people and in the community. And so many churches are drying up spiritually today with no effectiveness, struggling. And we look at these hopeless situations, whether it's in our personal lives or whether it's in our communities, whether it's within our church, and like Ezekiel, we don't have the answer. Much like my house that particular day, there's my car dead and I look around and I try to find another source and every other car is dead too. 
That's the way a lot, a lot of it is. A lot of the situation is in our churches today. People that are hurting, people that are looking for life, people that are looking for answers, but they show up at church and they just sit right by another dead person. The life of God's not in them either. Sometimes it seems like a hopeless situation, don't it? So where does the change come from? We need revival. I think that's pretty obvious. I think our need for revival in America and our need for revival in our community and our need for revival in our church and our need for revival within our homes, I think that's as obvious as a fish needs water. But where does the life come from? There are two essential things. What does revival look like and where, what does revival require? And there's two things that are essential elements of revival. That is the Word of God and the Spirit of God. The Word of God and the Spirit of God. There will, every revival that has ever taken place in all of history, you can go back to the Garden of Eden, you can go to Ezekiel and every revival since. The Word of God and the Spirit of God are the two essential elements to revival. Because God is the source of life. He is the source of power. So where does revival begin? Oh, dry bones, hear the Word of the Lord. Where does it begin? If you look in verse 11, you'll see where revival begins. Revival begins when we recognize and when we repent of our spiritual condition. That's where it begins. God told Ezekiel, you see this valley of dry bones? That represents the spiritual condition of my people. Whenever you look for answers to the deadness, whenever you look to the answers for the dryness in your life, you need to know the cause if you're going to find the cure. You need the right diagnosis if you're going to get the right treatment. Otherwise, you're going to keep putting Band-Aids on heart attacks and you're going to keep, take, keep taking aspirin tablets for cancer treatment. You've got to know the cause if you're going to get to the cure. And if you want to see the cause of Israel's dryness, look with me in chapter 36. Go to verse 16 in chapter 36. The word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, while the house of Israel lived in their land, they defiled it with their conduct and their actions. Their behavior before me, God says, was like menstrual impurity. It's the way God saw their sin. So I poured out my wrath on them because of the blood they had shed on the land and because they had defiled it with their idols. I dispersed them among the nations and they were scattered among the countries. I judged them accordingly to their conduct and their actions, God says. And when they came to the nations where they went, they profaned my holy name because it was said about them, These are the people of the Lord. And yet they had to leave the land in exile. Then I had concern for my holy name, which the house of Israel profaned among the nations, where they went. That's the cause. That was the cause. The people's disobedience to God had led them to depart from God, which had led to God's discipline in their lives, which led to the dryness and the deadness. And the source of that was their idolatry. Their idolatry. What is idolatry? Idolatry exists in many forms, but idolatry is simply this. Idolatry is whenever you replace God in your life as the source of your worship, as the source of your strength, as the source of who you are. When you replace God, no matter what you replace Him with, that's idolatry. 
In, Isra- in Israel's history, Baal and Asheroth were two idols, two false gods that were stumbling blocks to the people of Israel. Baal and Asheroth were gods of the crops. They were gods of fertility. And the people sought to worship God, the living God, but they also sought to worship Baal and Asheroth because they wanted to ensure that they were successful. They wanted to ensure that their families and their crops were were fruitful and they were fertile. They wanted to ensure happiness and fulfillment in their lives. So they departed from worshiping the living God alone and they began to worship Baal and Asheroth as well, seeking success, productivity, and prosperity. Idolatry always centers on alignment. Whatever you align your heart with, your desires, your thoughts, your words, your actions, whatever you align your heart with in order to meet your needs, to be fulfilled and to be happy, That's an idol in your life if it's not the Lord. The things that your life revolves around that do not bring you closer to God and that do not bring glory to God and your life revolves around them, that's your idol. That's your idol. You can come to church every Sunday, sit in the pew and have idols in your life and in your heart. Because anything that you replace God with as the source of your guidance, the source of your strength, and the source of your provision is an idol. What you spend your energy on seeking in order to fulfill your life and to give you happiness, other than God, is an idol. The things that you turn to first when you are stressed out and when you're struggling and the things that you turn to first for relief And for peace, if it's not God, it's an idol. When your family and friends, if your family and friends are asked to describe you, what is he like or what is she like? The first things that come to their mind, oh, he's all about work, or he's all about this, or she's all about that, or she's all about that. If it's not the Lord, it could be your idol because that's what's defining you. That's kind of sobering, isn't it? The things in your life that you sacrifice for in order to hold on to them because you believe they're going to give you success and satisfaction, the things you sacrifice for, if it's not to the Lord, It's your idol. And in Israel's history, their idolatry led to their disobedience, which led to their departure, which led to God's discipline, which led to their dryness, which led to their deadness. And it works the same way in our lives today. But God gave them a promise. In 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, centuries before this exile, God had given them a promise. And he told them, he said, If my people, if my people who are called by my name, if they will humble themselves, if they will recognize their spiritual condition, if they will recognize where they have departed from me, if they will pray, if they will align their hearts with me again, And they will seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. God says, then I'll hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin. I will heal their land. It's God's promise. But it requires us to recognize and repent of our spiritual condition. Let me give you some good news. When you go to the book of Ezra and you go to the book of Nehemiah, you're going to find history there. And what you're going to find is you're going to find the fulfillment of the promises that were given to Ezekiel. You're going to find the first steps of that fulfillment. Because in Ezra and Nehemiah, you find the exiles returning to the land. In Ezra, they are rebuilding the the city. They are rebuilding the temple first. In Nehemiah, they are rebuilding the walls of the city. And you know what those exiles are doing? 
What you read in Ezra and Nehemiah is this. You find them confessing their sins to God nationally. You find them in national repentance. You find them returning to the worship of God according to His Word. You find them returning to obedience to God's Word, and you find them recommitting themselves, taking vows to the Lord their God. You find them returning to God. And you find them renewing themselves in Ezra and Nehemiah. You know what you see in Ezra and Nehemiah? You see what Ezekiel wrote about. You see the rattling of the bones. You see the rattling of revival. God's people returning to the land. It is historical in the nation of Israel. That's amazing. It doesn't matter if it's Israel's history, if it's the history of our church, if it's the history of our community, if it's your own personal history, recognizing our spiritual condition, repenting of our sin is the key step toward any hopeless situation being changed and experiencing revival. This very act of turning to God is what puts us in a position of experiencing God. And you might say, well, you know what? I'm going through this valley of tribe bones and I look in my life and I've tried to be faithful to God. I've tried to do what's right. But these other situations, whether it's my family, whether it's my community, the things that have happened, they have taken me to this valley and why should I have to repent? Well, ask Daniel and ask Ezekiel and ask all those exiles that returned. You know, many of them Many of them had sought to serve the Lord, but they still experienced a valley. Because sin affects everybody. And all of us, as God's people, no matter where we are, have to recognize our spiritual condition and turn to the Lord in humility and in repentance seeking Him. The second thing I want you to see is this. Revival requires us to return to God's Word. It requires us to return to God's Word. Did you hear how many times God told Ezekiel, prophesy to the bones? Oh, dry bones, hear the Word of the Lord. Ezekiel was told to speak God's Word. Don't miss this, okay? Ezekiel was told to speak God's Word to the hopeless situation. That's the key step. After we've turned to God, the next thing we turn to, we turn to His Word. Ezekiel was told to speak the Word of God to a hopeless situation. Why? Because truth transforms. Truth sets us free. Truth brings life. And this takes us back, and I think this is this is awesome thought here. It takes us back to Genesis 1 and 2. If you go back to Ezekiel 36, what you'll see is this. As God talks about restoring His people from their sin, it says there in verse 35, it says this land that was desolate is going to become like the Garden of Eden. That sets the stage for the prophecy that God has given Ezekiel. And he says, hey, just like I'm the God that brought all creation into being, and how did creation fall into order? When you read Genesis 1 and you read Genesis 2, it says, and God said, let there be, and it was. What else was present at creation? The Spirit of God that was hovering over the darkness. So we see that God's Word brought order to all of creation. God's Spirit brought life to it. God's Word was the authority of all of creation. God's Spirit was the activator of that truth in that life. Then you come to Genesis chapter 2, and it says that God took man, He formed him from the dust of the earth, and He breathed life into his nostrils. This is the same picture that you see in Ezekiel 37, but on a grand scale. Don't miss the point. God is the source of life, and in order for us to be revived, in order for us to have life from death and from those dead, hopeless situations, 
It begins with the Word of God ordering our lives. Through the Word of God, the bones came together, bone by bone, muscle by muscle, tissue by tissue, and skin formed, and that vast army stood. Life is ordered by God's Word. And in Hebrews 4.12 it says, For the Word of God is living, it is effective, it is sharper than any double-edged sword, it is penetrating even as far as the separation of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It is able to judge the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. You see, God's word is the authority to all of life. And in order for us to be revived, our lives have to be ordered by the word of God. Revival starts when we let God's word speak into the desperate, dry, dead, hopeless situations of our lives. When we come to God's word and we begin to order and rearrange our lives according to his truth. As Jesus said, man doesn't live by bread alone. He lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Father. God was telling Ezekiel, I have a purpose. Speak my word over this situation. And you're going to see me bring a nation back to life. Man, that's powerful. In 2 Timothy, verse 3, 16 and 17, it says that all Scripture, all Scripture, Genesis to Revelation, all Scripture is inspired by God. In other words, that's literally God breathed. God breathed into this living document, this divine document from Genesis to Revelation. All scripture is inspired by God. And listen to this. It is profitable. It is to your benefit. It is to give you life. It is profitable in teaching, in rebuking, in correcting, in training for righteousness so that the man of God, so that the people of God may be, listen, complete. (laughs) That's how your life is complete. That's how your life is fulfilled by ordering your life according to the word of God. And equipped, Paul says, for every good work. We become that vast army when we let God's word order our lives. You know, unfortunately, I was in the hospital about a week ago. And uh, this hospital laid out, man, it was confusing. I don't know who designed this hospital. You go in, you know, you get to looking for where you're going. And, and it's like everything looks the same, and there's all these little hallways and turns and creeks and all of this, and it's like, you know, I don't know where I'm going. You know, the little lady at the desk, you know, she told me, well, you go down here, you take a right, you take a left, take another right, and then you take a, another left, and then you'll see some elevators there. You get off those elevators, you take a right and another left, and you go down a little bit further and take another left, and there you'll find it. I'm like, whoa, it's blowing my mind. But in that hospital, on the wall... There's a map. You see those maps in the hospital? They help you navigate where you're supposed to be going to help you navigate that maze of the hospital. And what's the most important thing? I mean, the map is is extremely important because it orders your steps that you're to take to get where you're going. But the most important part of that is finding that little star. The little star on the map. You know what I'm talking about? That little star that says, you are here, right? Because if you don't know where you are, you're not ever going to figure out where you're going. And so you have to know where you are in order to know how to get to where you're going. God's word orders our life on where we need to be going. But you have to know where you are. You have to know who God is. You have to know what He wants from your life. And once you know where you are, and once you know who God is, then you know how to get where you're going. You can't have revival. You can't see life come to hopeless situations in your life without God's Word. It orders everything. Now let's look at the next thing I wanted you to see. We have to rely on God's Spirit. 
We have to rely on God's Spirit. We've got to return to God's Word. We've got to rely on God's Spirit. You see, the bodies of this vast army, they come together, but there's something missing that is greatly needed. And what is that? It is the breath of life. You see, God's Word and God's Spirit working together to bring life to fulfill God's purpose. God's Word is the authority. God's Spirit is the activator of the power to accomplish God's purpose. And here from the exile, follow me real quickly. Here from the exile, God would give His people what's known as the New Covenant. You read about it in Jeremiah 31 because Jeremiah and Isaiah were, the pro- were prophets who spoke to the coming exile. In Jeremiah 31, you read of the New Covenant that will come to the nation and it will come to God's people. A New Covenant where God will write His law on their hearts and they'll have a renewed special relationship with God that would come through the promised Messiah and the pouring out of His Spirit. P- Peter talks about that in his first sermon that he preached in Acts chapter 2. He says, what you see in the pouring out of the Holy Spirit, this is a fulfillment of Jeremiah 31. Then you read about Isaiah. Isaiah pointed to Jesus as the one, as the promised one. And through his ministry and through his mission, the new covenant would come. When Jesus came on the scene, he said, I I am the Messiah. I'm the Son of God. And he said, I, through my life, death, and resurrection, he was going to bring salvation to all man. But he said, the promise of the Spirit would come through Him. Now, the promise of that Spirit in John 16, this is what the work of the Spirit is. This, and this is important. I want you to catch this. I want you to be patient with me. Give me just a tad longer today. This is important. John 16, this is the work of the Spirit. When He comes, when that Spirit is poured out, which happened in the New Testament church, right, in Acts, it says when He comes... He will convict the world about sin, righteousness, and judgment. It's the Spirit's job to convict your heart, your life, our church of sin, of our spiritual condition before God. It is God's Spirit that shows us what righteousness is. When you're sitting in a church service and you're singing a song or you're you're hearing something preached from God's Word and you have this deep sense of your unworthiness and you have this great sense of how wonderful and righteous and holy God is, that's the work of the Holy Spirit. He's working in your heart. You better take note. You better listen up because His job is to convict. His job is to bring about the conviction of sin, righteousness, and judgment. But his job is also, as Jesus goes on to say in John 16, when the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will glorify me, Jesus said. In Acts chapter 1, Jesus told the disciples, he said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses. You will fulfill your purpose, but it won't be in your power. It'll be through the power of the Spirit that's coming upon you. So, follow me. The Spirit of God is what brings the Word of God into our lives, convicts us of our sin, guides us into His truth, and empowers us to live out God's purpose for His glory. So our relationship to the Spirit of God is critically important to the experience of the life of God within us and to revival of God's people. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 19 and 20, it says this, gives a warning. It says, do not, do not quench the Spirit. Do not quench the Spirit. Do not treat prophecies with contempt. In other words, like they don't matter. You want to know why we don't see revival? Because the people in the pew quench the Spirit of God. We quench the Spirit. We quench the Spirit. When the Word of God is preached and the Spirit of God begins to deal with our hearts about sin about our need for righteousness, about the things that we need to order in our life and to get right with God. And we deny that and we walk out the same way we came in. That's quenching the Spirit. 
when we refuse to yield to the conviction that God is putting on our hearts, we quench the Spirit and God can't work. And what happens is we're just like a valley of dry bones. There's no power. There's no life of God that's being transferred from God to us. Because when we quench the Spirit, we disconnect from the Word of God and the Spirit of God that brings the power of God into our lives. And that's where many of us are today. In Ephesians chapter 5, it says, Do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. And what is the Lord's will? Verse 18, Do not be drunk with wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. That is God's will for your life. That is God's will for every Christian. That is God's will for His church. That is God's will for His people to be filled with His Spirit. And the picture that Paul gives us there is just as a person consumes alcohol and that alcohol affects every cell of their body, that alcohol, when a person's intoxicated, you people say, well, well, they're not acting themselves. They're a really good person until they start drinking because they're considered under the influence, Right? And so the picture that Paul has given us is that the spirit of the living God for the Christian should be what is influencing your thoughts, influencing your actions, influencing your motivations, influencing your priorities, your purpose, your passion. It should be influencing everything about you. And so the spirit, when you come to God's word... Man, you read the Ten Commandments, which forms the moral foundation of God's, of, of God's will for your life and your relationships. And do you know that most Christians can't, can't even name the Ten Commandments? We, are, we have come to a point where we're so biblically illiterate. I mean, we need to get into God's Word. And you know revival starts when, when people in the church, when Bible studies start filling up because people really want to know what God's Word says. We, go, we have revival in July, and we move into August, and our Sunday school doesn't increase. Our discipleship training at night doesn't increase. We had not had revival. You know why? Because when you get revived, you're going to want to know what God's Word says, and you're going to want to get together with people and start studying that Word so your life can be ordered by that Word, and God's power can be brought into your life through that Word. Side note, sorry. So when we get God's Word and God's Spirit into our lives and we yield to that Word, that's where the power takes place. That's where the power takes place. Do you know, you can take this cord. We can hook it up to the live battery, the battery that has the power in it. We can hook it up. Revival takes place when you allow God's Word and God's Spirit to influence and to rule over every area of your life. Instead of quenching it, you obey it. And that's where the power comes from. Because see, you can take it and you can hook it up to the live battery, but if you only hook up one and you don't hook up both to your life, And so many people today, they're coming to church, they hear the word, they hear the word, but they quench the spirit because they don't obey the word. They don't yield their life to what God's telling them. And therefore, we stay in our dead, hopeless situation. But what God wants to do is God wants to renew us. He wants to revive us. He wants to bring His life into us. 
And that's what he says there in the latter part of his verses in Ezekiel. He said, tell my people, I, I will put my spirit in them. I will renew their purpose. You see, God never lost sight. And that's what I want you to see here. Revival takes place when we recognize and repent of our spiritual condition, when we return to the Word of God, and when we rely on God's Spirit, let His Spirit fill our lives and guide us. Then then you know the fruit of revival because God's people are renewed in their purpose. God's people are renewed in their purpose. Did you hear what he told Ezekiel? My people, my people, I will put my spirit in them. They will fulfill their purpose. And isn't it great that God never lost sight of his purpose for Israel despite their sin, despite their rebellion, despite their idolatry. He disciplined them. He restored them. He renewed their purpose. And this took place by his sovereign hand. From His will and His purpose come the covenant promises that were fulfilled in Jesus who became the Savior of the world and He's the reason why you're here today. Talk about God's sovereign hand in history. He brought a people that were decimated and defeated that were represented by a valley of dry bones. He brought them back to their land. He restored them as His people In that land, Ezekiel and Nehemiah, he also promised that he would reestablish them as one nation and no longer divided into two kingdoms. And when you look at the stage of world history, you see another fulfillment of Isaiah, of Ezekiel. In 1948, one day, Israel was declared a nation again. One nation united that exists today set by the sovereign hand of God for the purpose of God and sets the table for the end times and the second coming of Jesus Christ. God wasn't through with His people. God's not through with you. Despite our history, God has a purpose. 1 Peter chapter 2, 9, he says, You are a chosen people, talking to the church, talking to us. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. God's possession, and this is our purpose, that we may declare the praises of Him who called us out of darkness and into His marvelous light. Revival takes place when God's people are renewed in their purpose to be the people of God and to share His truth and to shine His light in this world. We renew our love, we renew our commitment of serving the Lord and live faithfully for Him. You know, a many of ministry and a many of mission has came out of God's people being revived. And a many a hopeless situation has been turned around by God's people being revived. Oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. You know, we may look around and see our spiritual dryness, deadness in our lives, in our community, even in our church. But the situation is not hopeless whether that dryness is in marriage or family or church or career or community, we don't have the answer. We can't change it on our own. But God can. And God does. And God has a purpose. Look at the history of Israel. He allowed them to be exiled. He allowed them to be scattered. He brought them back. He restored them in their land. And He worked through them to bring Jesus into the world to form the church, to proclaim the gospel that has transformed the world, and you sit here today because of God's sovereign hand. Oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. No matter our history, God can revive us. We need to make that connection with Him. We need to recognize and repent of our spiritual condition. We need to return. We need to return to the word of God and to the spirit of God relying on His Spirit. We need those jumper cables to connect us to His life and His power and renew us in our purpose. O oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Lord, I come to you today and I thank you for the opportunity, Lord, that we have to look at your word and just to see your hand, Lord, not only in history, but your hand in our history, in our story. 
Lord, I pray today as your spirit speaks to our hearts that we will not stand up from our pews and quench your spirit. Through our lack of faith, through our hardness of hearts, through our pride, through our self-centeredness, God, may we not hold on to our idols today. But God, may we come before you, Lord, in humility, in prayer, seeking your face, turning, Lord, from, from our evil ways so that you can forgive and you can heal and you can change our history. You can bring your life into us. You can stand us up. You can make us that vast army in our community as your church. And that we can fulfill our purpose. And Lord, I pray that as we come to this close of our service, that we would be filled with your spirit because we've received your word. And Lord, we're yielding ourselves to you. If you'll stand with me, if God's made a decision on your heart this morning and maybe need to come and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior.